Hey, what's going on everybody? This is Mike Colleen at MikeColleen.com The name of this song is Path Through the Mountains by Scott Buckley. Okay, so this video is being made because I have a really strong feeling that there's quite a few of you on my channel that are going through a really, really dark time right now. And the reason why I picked this song is the minute I heard it, and also the name Path Through the Mountains, is this captures the, the emotions and the feelings that I think a lot of you are going through right now and have been probably for a couple days to a couple weeks, maybe even longer than that. And the feeling, if I could describe it in one or two words, is darkness and daunting, like a very daunting darkness. It's like you're tired and on the inside there's just this sense of I want to say hopelessness. There's this sense of like it's just not going to work out. It's daunting like you have been going down this journey for a long, long, long time and now you're climbing this new set of mountains and I mean mountains. I'm talking about Swiss Alps. I'm talking like the just, just unbelievable. It's like it, you, you finally got to the peak and I think that's kind of an example. It's like you, you have overcome so much and you started to feel better and everything was starting to build and build in a really good way. And now you're at the peak and you can see how far you got to go and how far the mountains stretch and how you got to go all the way back down, all the way back up, all the way back down in this cold, frigid winter weather. Not only is it daunting, it's it's cold and it's it's dark. It feels impossible, doesn't it? So I'm gonna share my experience. Things have really turned around in a really, really good way. It's kind of a weird double I don't know what the right word like it's like a dichotomy I guess maybe that's the word it's a double and at the same time like like everything is just moving and then it's other other time there's this other thing going on inside so I'm gonna tell you something um I'm gonna give you try to give you an example of what it is and I'm gonna give you some ways to to get through it so on the one hand, I have overcame so much pain, hurt, let down in the last four years, um, and, and not to mention my life. So it's on the one hand, it's like the sun is shining, things are happening, and there's something else really, really positive going on in my life. So around January of this year, uh, so we're looking back at about seven months ago or so, something shifted like things just start man everything like all the negativity just let go and I'm just started moving forward charging forward not only in my business life and my social life but also my physical life I started to get physically stronger for the first time in 14 years since I got ran over by a car so for those of you who haven't been following me for a while, I don't think I've mentioned this in over a year. <clears throat> I actually got ran over by a car 14 and a half years ago. The music's going to go down in about 10 seconds. So there's a reason why I'm bringing all this up. It's not about me, it's about you. It's about someone specifically whose nickname is Zippy, okay? So Zippy's been a long time follower of this channel for I would say over a year or longer. And I've done some work with Zippy and Zippy just emailed me out of the blue. I haven't heard from him in probably three or four months or longer. And he's going through a really, really hard time. And the energy that came across through the email is, yeah, that's what I'm going through too.
So Zippy's case is a very intense case. He essentially can't walk anymore, and this is not a very wasn't nothing really happened. He just he had a job. He used to walk for a living, did all this stuff, and he used to have to deliver stuff. So he would do I think he said eleven or fourteen miles a day or more. And he can't walk right now. And he's a, a fairly young guy. I never asked him his age, but I think he's about 30, 34, something like that. Now, when I say he can't walk, I mean, he hasn't walked, I think it's been two years. Like, they're just like, yeah, you can't walk. And the doctors really don't know why. So, in the healing world, the spirit world, I also want to say is... I think you would be really shocked and surprised at how some people will just instantly heal from cancer or or not being able to walk or all kinds of things when all of a sudden they just have a realization or they have a belief change. Now there's an actual t a technique that we're taught that can help you to change a belief, okay? Sometimes it's that easy. Sometimes there's a deeper lesson. It could be the purpose that you came here, or one of the purposes that you came here was to develop strength, to, to, to finally find your own inner strength, to fight back, to stand up for yourself, to take action. So, do you guys remember, the, um, oh, he's a real famous actor, he's a black actor, he's older. He did that movie with Jim Carrey, and he was uh, this guy was uh, God. Morgan Freeman. He's a wonderful, wonderful person. So there have been some clips of him talking on YouTube shorts, and I think some of them were actually taken from that movie Bruce Almighty, uh, where he was God, and then Jim Carrey got to play or to be, to step into God's shoes for so many days or whatever. So he says, you know, when people ask for strength, God doesn't give them strength. He gives them challenges to become strong and he says when people want to overcome fear and pray to God you know like, like help me get over this fear he says God doesn't make you fearless God gives you challenges to overcome fear and some of us ask God for love And God will put you on the most treacherous journey to finally learn to fall in love with yourself. See, when you reject your inner self, you create this energy of self-rejection. So when others come around you, they reject you also. This is the narcissist number one nightmare, but they don't. God, it's such a, man, how do I explain this? It's such a twisted way that they go about it, and it'll, it'll never get them the goal that they're trying to, to accomplish or achieve. So God will bring you these challenges where you have to love yourself. It's like there's no other choice. So the narcissist, what they've done is they have taken, taken the real them and they have shoved that so far down, locked it away, locked, it, locked their being so far deep into a dungeon that's, that is layers and layers and layers, floors, levels and levels below, that you never actually met the narcissist. You actually never met the real person. So the narcissist's how do I say this? It's the ultimate rejection of self. They have just completely denied themselves and rejected themselves. And guess what their number one fear in life is? Yep, rejection. Now here's the most bizarre part about it. Instead of loving themselves, embracing themselves, holding themselves, crying with themselves, allowing their inner self to cry, they completely deny themselves. And they constantly get into relationships and they continually reject the person, you, in every way possible until you finally reject them. 
And if you're one of those empaths earlier on in life where you never reject them and just put up with all their torment and abuse, they'll eventually just be like, well, this isn't working, and they cut you out of their life. And then they will find another person that will eventually reject them. Because that's what, okay, the way you see yourself, the way you treat yourself, the way you experience yourself is the way you will interact with other people. Not only, not only will you hurt them and reject them viciously, on an unconscious level, they're trying to get you to reject them viciously. Why? See, the purpose is they have this core belief. And you know what's funny? They probably are not even aware of it. A lot of times, all of us, we're not aware of all kinds of beliefs that we have. So the belief is essentially that they're not good enough. And so when they get around people that act like they are good enough, they it doesn't it doesn't match it doesn't match their beliefs. So they're like, oh okay, something feels weird here, nothing it's not congruent with them. So when people treat them well and, and treat them as if they are a good enough person, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, it doesn't match up with their image of who they are, with their belief of who they are. And there's a lack of congruency within their system. And so essentially they kind of just fade away. And there's no real big, big thing that happens. No big explosion or argument. There may actually be an argument or something. Or, you know, a lot of times when, okay, when you love someone who doesn't love themselves, they will explode at you they will get mad and like no no and you're like you're wrong and you may have an argument about something completely separate that seemingly seems to be different but really what it is is like hey no i'm not good enough and you're treating me like i am so this isn't going to work so what happens is they move on to someone else probably an empath especially if they're a narcissist and they will abuse the empath or this kind, loving, spiritual, open-hearted person until they get that person to either walk away, reject them, say something mean, finally, finally stand up for themselves. And then they're like, ah, oh, see, nobody likes me or, or see, you are the mean one, you know, like it's like whatever their belief is. See, what they do is they suck you into their belief system. And guess what? We all do this to some degree. But that doesn't mean we do the tactics like narcissists do, and et cetera, et cetera. That's a completely separate thing. So we all do things on an unconscious level. Now here's the really, really cool thing. When you begin to catch yourself doing the stupidest things to the nicest people, to people that you really wanted in your life and you did something that pissed them off. Like, wait, why did I even do it? That's your unconscious mind. Now, here's the really cool part of this. When you begin to catch yourself and recognize, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Why did I say that? Or I can't believe I said that. No wonder why they're pissed off. So when you start seeing yourself do these things that you're like, that's not even who I am. Like, why would I do that? It's, well, your unconscious mind has a belief that you don't deserve them. They're too good for you. You're not good enough. You don't deserve love. Who knows? Whatever it is, you'll be like, yeah, this doesn't match with me. It's no, no, I don't mean consciously. It's an unconscious thing that you do. It's like there's something doesn't feel right. It's not congruent. So you move on to someone else who will treat you in this not good way. And this will continue to happen. You Instead of running into good people and connecting with good people, you'll kind of fade out either just like not call them back or, you know, like cut a conversation short and walk away until you eventually meet someone who eventually abuses you, is mean to you, says bad things to you, hurts you, makes you feel alone or, or whatever it is. It it's, depends on the person. Until this happens so many times that you you start to recognize the pattern. See, a lot of therapy that I do with people is helping them to, to see their own beliefs. 
to see their own decisions that they've made on an early age in life where it's just unconscious now to look at the rules that you've just blindly accepted because well a teacher said this or your father said something in anger one day oh well that's just the way it is well, it was powerful and he yelled and screamed oh, okay that's that's the way it is and you start to become conscious of these beliefs and become aware of them awareness is absolutely the first step to healing so i got ran over by car 14 years ago it made life absolutely impossible i got zero help from anybody the medical system failed me absolutely 100 percent That in and of itself is one hell of a story. So I'm not going to go into that right now. They never sent any assistance. I was supposed to, so I had full coverage insurance and all that. That wasn't the problem. They just, the doctors just didn't do it. Somehow I dealt with all of it, all of it from going to the grocery store to everything on my own in the hospital. Like, Hey, this is going to take you 10 to 12 years even longer to heal from this this is going to take a long time i got zero 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 help i went to my regular medical doctor i think twice so i broke over two dozen bones when i mean when i say broke i mean completely snapped through all the way i did spinal injuries neck injuries i tore my brain in three places Somehow I made it through this and as I look back like I, I couldn't even talk English now you think I'm joking I'm not for that first 18 months to 24 months. I was just like word salad city like words were coming out backwards Inside out the wrong things were instead of saying I'm gonna go see my doctor I'd say oh, I'm gonna go go talk to my God and I remember my goddaughter goes what? Now this was about two and a half years after the accident. I was bumbled my words come out wrong. I had zero memory at all. No family help. Even my goddaughter, she disappeared for about, I think it was nine months or so. And even then, she never came in and checked on me. I mean, I was on my own, period, end of sentence. I mean, I had, I had bones sticking out of my ribs. They were broken backwards. I'm going to tell you when it all started. Let me, okay, here's, here's, okay. There was a sense of resolve that happened. When I got ran over by the car, I remember when I woke up in the middle of the street, I, I couldn't get up. I mean, I, I, tr I tried to get up. I got just almost to my feet and the, bl and the blood pressure just collapsed and I fell on the ground. I was probably asleep for another 30 minutes or more. And so I remember I looked around and people would pull up in cars and, and they would stop. They would take pictures and they would look and they would talk to each other and they'd just take off. No one called for help. This went on for about two and a half, maybe three hours. And I remember at one point looking across the street saying, somehow I've got to get to that door. And I remember saying, this is on me. Nobody's going to help me. Something inside changed. Something shifted. And I don't mean just for that moment or that day or that week or that month or for the pain, the injuries, the healing. I mean for the rest of my life. Something was like, no, it's on me. Everything is on me. I don't know how to explain it. I remember looking up from the ground, looking across. I literally, I was literally face down on the street, face down. And I looked and I was like, somehow I have to do this. And that's what it was. It was somehow, somehow I, something in my gut have to do this. And it stuck with me ever since like that. I mean, I, I do not know how to explain it. Because women, women, mothers would pull up with their teenage daughters and they would take pictures and video and, and talk about it. And they would, and, and I would cry out, please call help, please. And I would say 911 or hospital. I would just blurt words out like that. And I remember one mom, oh, she kind of got scared and she just bolted away. You know, I'm going to say something, and I used to be very, very angry at this person for this, but I'm not anymore because <clears throat> beyond a shadow of a doubt, this was part of my journey. There's, there's no two ways about it. The only number I, I could remember was my goddaughter's number. 
and I just kept repeating that number over and over and I think they finally figured like oh there's probably someone he knows and they called her she showed up and I was still strapped down they just pulled me out of the uh, MRI and x-rays and all that stuff and I'm just like literally strapped down my even my forehead I couldn't move and the doctor just immediately said hey you know he's got all these broken bones he just told her about the x-rays you know on and on and on she goes oh okay oh and he told her like yeah we're going to keep him for 12 weeks up to 18 weeks depending on you know how how he recovers so she goes oh, okay well i gotta go and i remember just like crying please don't leave me and she she goes no i gotta go to a party and she just left and the next morning, they're waking me up, putting me in a wheelchair, and my goddaughter walks in. I'm kind of like, what, 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 kind of wondered. I thought, you know, kind of first I thought, oh, that's very caring of her to show up. I assumed I was going to get more x-rays and tests done. They wheel me outside, and she's kind of bewildered. And and they next thing you know, the nurse is saying, you know, help, uh, help, help me. And and they they put me in the car, took me home, dropped me off, and left me. And that's it. No family, nothing. My goddaughter didn't even show up. She didn't call, nothing. So I woke up about five days later realizing I have to go pee really bad. And I, try, I stumbled. I could not walk and fell through the glass uh, sliding doors of the uh, shower. Uh, fell right through and boom, I was out for a while. I eventually got up and I got back to bed somehow. And you're thinking, oh, well, you know, they checked up on you. Nobody checked up on me. Nobody. After about a month, maybe a little bit longer, I essentially had ran out of food. I had no more tuna, no more nothing. And so for the first probably week or so, I didn't eat at all. Probably even two, maybe ten days. Um, but my, I'm trying to make an overall bigger point of all this. I'll try to end this part with this. So I essentially walked to the grocery store which is two and a half blocks away it took me an hour and then it took me about another hour to get back i had to stop and rest and you know kind of like where am i i was i was i was messed up bad so essentially the first five or six weeks was me just doing nothing but sleeping and drinking water i mean it was all i could do to just get to the bathroom sink i'm not kidding so over the next 10 years, people treated me like absolute shit. One thing I've learned, now I remember we learned this in psychology class, but when people can sense that you're weak, they, they go in for the kill. People are very, very animalistic. People were cruel. People were mean. People would scream at me. People would threaten me. And I would just be sitting there standing in line somewhere minding my own business. But you know what? All of this strengthened me. I, I don't explain it. It was, um, even while I was going through, yeah, it hurt. It hurt bad. It was, especially the social treatment. After about two years, I remember my, I did go to my doctor eventually. He said, look, you need to kind of get out in public. Like, you should probably go to the mall, walk around. The security guards were the ones that were mean to me. And the doctor said, you should go there because there's security guards and you'll be safe. So I had lost all physical abilities. I couldn't run. I couldn't do it. I remember, oh God, I don't know how long it took me to get past this, but I couldn't walk the length of my living room and back. So that walk to the grocery store, I cannot believe I made that because I had to, had to constantly stop. It seemed like 100 miles at the time. Now the pain... Um, I got a bottle of hydrocodone from the hospital and after taking one pill, cause I think they wanted me to take three pills a day or two, two pills, three times a day or some ridiculous amount. And I remember going, you know, I'm pretty sensitive to medication. So I took one and holy shit, I was in la la land. This was amazing. And the very next day I took another one and I realized like, Oh, this is going to get me addicted. Oh, this is how people get addicted. Because they're in massive pain. They don't have any other choice. And I was like, oh, fuck this. So I didn't take a pill for about a week. And then I took a half a pill because the pain was so excruciating. And then I'd make myself wait another week and I'd take a half a pill. 
and then I would fight it and try to do it for about two weeks or ten days and then it got to the point where I essentially was taking half a pill oh, probably every four weeks or something like that now was I in pain absolutely freaking lutely you have no idea my whole back and neck locked up the pain was just like I mean you gotta understand I played football in high school and college I was a national champion kickboxing wrestling football state champion blah 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 I mean I know what pain is and this was worse than anything I'd ever experienced but I knew if I kept taking those pills, I was going to get addicted. So I was like, nope, I'm not taking them until I absolutely have to. And I would take about a half of one once a month. And then even then, I probably stopped at about the sixth month. I just completely was like, no, I'm not going to get addicted to this stuff. So essentially, at one point, I got to, and this was literally about probably a year, no, it was a long, probably two years later, I would go out at night. And we have this long garage under the building and I would try to walk the length of the garage and back and that's essentially all I could do. This went on for months and months, even even I would say the fourth year, I could walk about two blocks and back. Maybe a little bit more than that at that point. But I couldn't jog, I couldn't run, even oh god, six, seven years later. I couldn't I could not jog more than a block at most if that and that was years later years and years oh god probably four five six years so part of the journey was uh i had used that first bottle down to half okay half the bottle and i just left it and it was about two and a half three years later my doctor uh might have been four years later he goes hey you know where are you getting your pain pills from I'm like oh i haven't been taking them he's like are you serious? He goes, well, what are you doing for the pain? I'm like, I'm just taking the pain. And he goes, you're joking. I'm like, no, I'm not. He goes, oh, God. So he writes me out a prescription. I'm like, no, no, okay, doctor, I still got the half bottle left. He goes, he goes, that's not as strong. He goes, they wear out after time. He goes, I'm going to give you another prescription. I want you to go get it. And I did. But I took a half a pill one day because it did help my back. And then... I waited a month, did it again, and then I did it half a pill a month later, and then I did the, the other half of the second pill, and I thought, nope, and I threw the bottle away. So here I am dealing with all this pain on my own, and you gotta understand, for me to take a half a pill once a month, like I had to be in massive pain for me to, to do that. So I threw it away, and I dealt with the pain. I don't remember what year it was. It might have been the sixth year, the seventh or the eighth year. And I remember I just broke down crying. And it was because I was in so much pain. And all of a sudden, I started laughing. I just started laughing and laughing and laughing. I literally started to laugh at the pain. And then I started to laugh at that because I realized what I was doing. I just stopped caring. And what I mean is I stopped caring about, <clears throat> sorry, about the pain. I was the happiest guy on the planet. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I really was. I just, something like, I didn't matter anymore. Pain, it wasn't, what's the word? It wasn't a... It wasn't a factor in my life anymore. So at this point, I could walk, oh God, probably two miles, may maybe a little more at this point, but it was a very slow pace. I could jog maybe three quarters of a block to a block. Then I'd have to walk about a block. I would say a block, but it was probably more like three blocks, and then I'd struggle to jog and and the, and the, the other thing is the, the, the pain from the exercise was excruciating. So anytime I did any kind of exercise, my back would lock up for five to seven days. And that's what I used to use the, the, the uh, hydrocodone for because it would loosen up my muscles and allow my back to adjust and, and not be locked. Because when, lock, when it locks up, it hurts. Like the, the pain was sharp. 
But I just, I just didn't care. I couldn't do push-ups at this point. My spine was too out of whack. My left shoulder was had a partial separation. I just, I couldn't do push-ups. I couldn't do sit-ups. I, I could walk. That's essentially what I could do. And I could ride a bike of all things, which was kind of funny. And it was exhausting. It was insanely exhausting. So I hit a milestone just this week. I rode from San Rafael. Now I have a fixie. It's got one gear. It's kind of a medium large gear, so it's hard. I rode that bike for the first time in 14 years from here all the way to Sausalito and back. And I got so excited that I think it was two days or three days later, I did it again, except this time I went all the way up the hill to the uh there's like a watch area a lookout area where a resting area you can look out and a lot of people get out and they sell hot dogs and stuff and then i i did it again uh just just a few days ago and i i rode all the way across the golden gate bridge and all the way back to san rafael i'm stronger now than i've been in 14 years i'm doing push-ups again push-ups are insane right now like i mean i i remember God, I think even two years ago, I don't think I could even do uh, 10 push-ups. So my point is through all this pain, I don't know, it's like something about laying in the street when it happened. I just remember like, I have to do this. It, it shifted something inside. No more waiting for other people to do what they say they're going to do. No more asking for help. No more, like even if you do ask for help, there's no more waiting. Like, oh, they didn't do it. Oh, I'm moving on. It's like something in my whole life has just shifted. It's like, no, it's it's up to me. It's not up to that mechanic. It's not up to this person. It's not up to my friend who says he's going to do this thing that he hasn't done for a week. Nope, done. I'm not waiting for you anymore. I'm moving on. Even four, five, six years later, when it was really hard to jog even two blocks and I'd have to walk for two or three blocks to catch my breath, and there was like this neurological connection. Like, I, I remember the first, I don't know, if it was the first nine months or whatever, like just, I would go from, I'm looking at it right now, for, to my sliding glass window living room and then all the way through the living room to my front door and then back. That was an exercise. I'd have to stop and catch my breath. I mean, that took me years. And then I got to the point where I could do it for about 10 reps, maybe even 12. Then I went down to the garage. I don't know, our garage is probably 100 feet, maybe 150 feet long. And I remember the first time I ran the length of it or jogged or whatever you want to call it, it was exhausting. And yet it was, I know it sounds funny because it was empowering. But it's weird because, I mean, years had gone by and on a logical level, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm barely progressing. I mean, it was like insanely so small, the amount of progress that I had made. And yet this is all I can do. Now I'm riding my bike, this one gear bike, freaking 20 miles a day, doing it twice a week, sometimes three times a week. I'm running, I'm doing hills, push-ups, sit-ups, it's, you know, stretching, like really, like before I would, when you get hit in the head, and even if it's a concussion, it can tighten up your muscles really bad. My calves were completely in lock for the about nine years, 10 years, even then stretching them I had to be very, very careful not, not to tear them. This is 10 years later, and they finally unlocked, not just that, but my thighs, my hamstring, my muscles in general, my body, the nerves, my brain finally kind of like let go. And all of a sudden, I'm stretching again for like 15, 20 minutes now, whereas I could barely stretch for five seconds or barely do whatever. I did not explain it, and I don't know why it... it I, I, I do, though. It goes back to when I was laying down in the middle of the street. I just was like, no one's going to help me. Something about being put in that position put me back into my power. And throughout this whole journey, man, I cannot explain to you how powerful I feel now. It is the most empowering feeling. And it wasn't, it, it, it was even. Even in that moment in the street, that first day when I woke up from getting hit by the car and making that decision. 
even after five or six years and I'm like man I can't even jog like literally two blocks it was like the progress was so slow walking up two flights of stairs or even this we have this uh, on the building one flight of stairs it's still I had to grab the rails I was wobbly I was I was like a 75 80 year old man who who had cerebral palsy like literally I was in the, and people would just look it was embarrassing it was humbling it was I don't know what the word is it, it was it wasn't easy but I tell you what it was a really powerful experience and it still is to this day you know there's people who treated me like shit during this whole experience and I tell you what they see me now and like oh hey, I was like You're, you've changed I'm like yeah I, I go I've healed they're like healed from what I go I got run over by a car like oh and so they act dumb they act stupid and i look at them like i am gonna fuck you up i am gonna rip your head off i have this stare or this look and the funny thing is i'm not trying to do anything at all i just but i have this very very like very matter of fact look now when i look at people and a lot of people just like oh you've changed like yep i sure have i've healed You know, I was told that I'd never walk normal again. I was told I'd never work out or exercise. I was told that I, was, I would never uh, speak normal again. I remember my doctor, it was probably the third year, maybe three and a half, maybe even four. I just, he goes, well, what's wrong? And I'm, and I'm you know, not speaking very good. I'm kind of stumbling with my words and like, I'm not normal. I'm not the same. And he goes like, well, what do you mean? And I, you know, explained like, hey, like, how long is this going to take? And he goes, well about 10 or 12 years and he realized like oh no no i don't think you understand that's just going to be the healing process he goes you're never going to be the same again he goes michael this is your life you're going to have to adjust to it and realize this is the way it's going to be from now on well he moved away about seven years ago or something like that maybe six years ago and i ran into him in whole foods the week before Christmas, it was two or three Christmases ago, and he didn't even recognize it. I go, it's me, Mike, the guy that got ran over by the car. Boy. He goes, what happened? And I said, I healed. <laughs> he literally had a hard time recognizing me even at this point. Because I had healed so much and he was just, like, he, like he did, like, okay, a lot of people during that phase, if they met me after the accident and then they didn't see me for a few years, you know, th after I healed towards the end, they were like, wow, you're really different now. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, well, you used to kind of, you were slow and you kind of were, you know, timid and, you know, you stumbled a lot with your words. I'm like, well, yeah, that's because it's healing from the accident. Like. Oh, you really got an accident? Like, yeah, I really got an accident. Like, oh, I thought you were just saying that and trying to cover up for being shy. Or like, no. So there's a lot more I could say about the conversation with my doctor. But one thing I would tell you that I, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I had to learn to be independent. I had to absolutely learn 100% that it's on me period end of sentence to stop asking help for people to stop waiting for people who say they're gonna you know like that that all came to a quick halt so am i doing good i'm doing great and yet recently there's been this this feeling in my gut i don't know if the gut's the right word but this feeling inside that there's <laughs> there's just this um I don't know, not impending doom, but the the word really is daunting. Like there's this daunting task that we have to overcome now, and it's very like it's over. Like I can't go anymore, and so it's like I finally got to this peak, and yet I'm like, oh my god, look at those mountains! Like you gotta understand, getting up this peak took freaking weeks days months and now I'm like now i gotta go all the way back down and then i gotta go all the way through all this bullshit to get to the next peak and then i have to begin the climb once again 
but there's something different inside. It's this calm, grounded demeanor. Something is different. There's this power that I've never had before in my life. So I have this client, Zippy. Um, I gave him, a, I think it was two free sessions, maybe a third one of the energy healing sessions. And he got very, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm just, this is a, kind of a, an, an anomaly for me. He got very little results. He did, he did notice some, uh, I think it was the first or second session, like he did notice, like, okay. And it gave him a lot of hope. And he was going back to school. We didn't really, you know, he didn't, I, in fact, I hadn't heard from him in months. In fact, I just got a, a message from him the other night. And he's walking upstairs uh, now, where which he couldn't do before. And I think he said it's a lot stronger now, but he says he feels like he's at the end of his life. And he's sad. He's very sad. And the minute minute I read that, I was like, "Yeah, that's exactly how. That's exactly how I have felt." It's it's a really weird dichotomy because on the one hand, I'm feeling great, man. I'm, I started working on my car and replacing things. I'm replacing axles. I'm doing all this stuff I've never done before. It is like for me, super rewarding doing stuff that I that I was terrified of doing years ago, my whole life actually. I'm going to sauce lead on my back and back. I'm doing push-ups, sit-ups, and lifting weights. I'm shadow boxing. I'm just like, like life is good now. I'm pushing myself way beyond anything I'd ever think thought that I'd ever I'd ever reach uh, again. And yet, there's there's been this this daunting feeling, like I said before, like, and I don't mean kind of. Oh, it's kind of. I mean, it's just like like over like whenever I go to bed, whenever I slow down. Whenever I'm not working on something or, or riding my bike all the way across Gold Gate Bridge, it's there. And to be honest with you, it, it was really upsetting until I read his email and he's saying, Hey, I feel like I'm at the end of my life. I'm really sad about it. And I instantly felt like, yep, I knew it. Because I had this feeling that a lot of people are going through this. It's not just me. It's like life's over. Like, yeah, I might live another 10, 15, 20 years, but that's it. I mean, no more hopes, no more dreams. I'm never going to get my business going the way I want it. Blah, 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 blah. It's like, they're, like, it's like this death roll. And you know what it is? A part of your life has finally healed. It is finally integrating inside you and it literally feels like a death. So a part of you that broke off many, many, many years ago, maybe even lifetimes ago, has finally healed. And it's, it's a really, it's, an, it's, it's a, it's a um, kind of an odd thing. Because when you finally discover that part, you become aware of like, oh, I've had this pattern for many, 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 many years, my whole life. And it then begins to realize like, wait a minute, I'm not my own being. It's like, no, you're actually a part of me. Your energy that I pushed out many years ago. And it begins to fight this battle. It's like, it, 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 to it, it feels like it's dying, but it's not. What happens is when it begins to realize like, oh, wait a minute, I'm not the core you. I'm just a part of you. Yeah, very, very finite, very small, like less than a millionth of an ounce. You're just this little tiny little part. What happens is they take, they took on their own beliefs and values thinking and rules and decisions thinking they're, they're you. So when they go up into your ego, and this is what your ego is, is when a little part of you goes up there, it takes over and do, 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 this is who I am. And it's like, no, that's not who you are. That's a, an actor. So when it begins to realize like, oh shit, because it'll start seeing its own patterns. It'll go, oh, wait a minute. I do the exact same strategy I've done ever since I was three years old. Oh, I'm not the core person. I'm just a part. When it starts to see that, it starts to freak out. Because to it, it feels like a death. This is what we call an ego death. But it's not dying. The energy of it, which is really a, was a part of the core you, it's like, imagine it's like liquid energy, like water. It comes back inside the core you and connects and becomes one with the core energy of who you are. 
like a droplet of water going back in the ocean. It's not separate from the ocean anymore. It becomes one with the ocean. There's not like the ocean and this little part over here anymore. That, that droplet of water goes back into the ocean and becomes one. And this is the process that you go through when you're kind of going crazy, you're going nuts, you feel like you know, you're know you up and down, you're crying, you're all over the... P this is what we call an ego death. It's beginning to awaken and realize, holy shit, I'm not Mike. I am a part of Mike that, that, that separated many, many years ago and is outside of Mike thinking, oh, I'm my own unique individual being, but it's actually not. And it will fight to the death to keep from integrating and it will lie to itself. It will do everything in its power to hold on to its integrity, thinking, well, I got, you know, I mean, like, essentially, I'm going to die if I don't do this. Now, who does that sound like? That sounds like a narcissist. But there's a huge core difference here. Whenever you integrate a part of your own, you kind of have this battle with yourself. Whereas a narcissist, how do I explain this? It's almost like a part of them did take over. <laughs> and it's been run of the show and it's just like... And instead of like having the battle with their own internal self, they're having this battle with people outside of them. It's kind of funny because they're, they're doing something that's never going to help them to heal. So essentially, this is an ego death. If you're feeling this um, kind of this death spiral, like it's over, that's it, I'm done. Like, like, like I'm never going to be happy again. I'm never going to live life. Life's never going to be fun. We're, I'm never going to have goals and I'll never get my dream or get my business off the ground. You're having an ego death. Let go. The more ego deaths you have, the more you integrate more of your power, more of your, your, it's literally little balls of energy that separated from you. The more you bring these droplets of energy back into you, the more powerful you become, the more you begin to thrive in life and things just seem to fall in place, blah, blah, blah. Because before that, all these little parts, you were fighting each other and they were fighting with you and it causes massive incongruency. Again, who does that sound like? A narcissist. Narcissists are like the epitome of everything that I'm describing right now to the extreme level. So there is one main difference between you and a narcissist. Essentially, on an unconscious level, you are having conflict with your own parts inside of you, whereas a narcissist projects their, their parts onto other people outside of them, and they begin to fight with that person. They begin to reject those parts. It's an illusion that is in their mind that they project because they do not want to see themselves. And that severity of not wanting to see anything imperfect in themselves is what causes this complete separation from self, okay? And the difference is with you, you will be open to the possibility of, okay, so what am I doing wrong or what can I prove or, oh, well, I didn't realize I was doing that. Whereas a narcissist would just not deny it and be like, nope, nope, that's not me, that's you. And the, everything is a projection. They don't want to face anything. Whereas us... Our whole goal is, well, how do I deal with this? How do I heal this? Like, what am I supposed to do? It's like, on the one hand, they want to be perfect. They want to be this, like, even, let's say, strong. They want to be, have strong muscles, but they don't want to do the push-ups to get the strong muscles. It's like, they want to just be like, oh, I'm this new person that came into my life. Now I can lift weights. It's like, well, no, actually, you can't because you don't lift weights. 
so they want the strength, they want the muscles, they want the trophy, they want the awards, but they don't want to do the work. They don't want to do the push-ups or the curls or the bench press or anything. They just want to be. Because even admitting that they have to do the push-ups and they're not already strong, it's, it's an acknowledgement of, yeah, I'm not this person who I want to be. It's an acknowledgement of not being perfect and they cannot deal with that at all. So let me kind of wrap this video up. So number one, I made this video because of Zippy. He's something happened where he just couldn't walk anymore. And he is walking upstairs and doing basic things, but it, it's been, I don't know if it's been two years or three years, but it's been a pretty long journey for him. So one of the things that I'm trying to say is this. You really have to turn this around. You have to completely shift your perspective on everything. Like here I was years later, I think six, seven years or so, and I was in so much pain that and I just was like the very little amount of progress that I had made in years. I still couldn't run past one or two blocks at a time. I just couldn't do it. I used to run seven miles every morning when I was in boxing. Every morning. It was just like, for me For me to run two or three miles was nothing. That was like nothing. And here I was working extremely hard for years. And I, I'm like, I'm barely, barely jogging two blocks before, at a slow rate. And very weak to, to where I had to stop and walk two or three blocks to get my energy back. But I persevered. I didn't stop. It was like, I didn't, I, man, I'm trying to put this door. It's like, okay, so I took all that pain that day because it wasn't just the pain I was in. It was the pain plus the realization of, wow, like, I, I can't get past two blocks. It was, I laughed. I just broke down crying and then I laughed at my tears and I laughed at the pain and that's what I mean about shifting perspective because it something changed you know you hear guys that are tough and everything and I've been done some pretty tough stuff in my life and you hear about people saying laugh at the pain and I and the funny thing is I did I, I was like I didn't care anymore so number one shift your perspective on the worst part of whatever it is that you're going through shift it number two persist have a persistence that is beyond anything and I would say number three look for other options be open to other possibilities like energy healing acupuncture prayer anything at all that you can think of I try different things and that's that's how I got out of my pit I kept looking One of the biggest things I do in my, if I could, if people, if people were to say, if you could name one thing, like, what is it that you're actually doing? What do you do for a living? I shift perspectives. That's what I do. When you come work with me, it's going to be shift, 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 shift. It's a constant shifting of your perspectives on everything. Because the perspective where you're at is obviously not working for you. And that's why you're stuck. It's just a perspective. I don't care what it is you're going through. The other thing is to realize and remember, you came here to learn. You are in a master's program. You are in a master's degree program. And I don't mean some state school, the university. This is the universal master's degree of the universe. You are going through one of the toughest trainings in the universe. If it's meant to be, it's up to me. Take full responsibility of everything that happens in your life. This is how you take charge of your life. This is how you begin to change circumstances in your life and events that happen to you. And you remember this, write this down. It didn't happen to me. It happened for me. 
Once you take full responsibility for everything that happens to you in your life, now you become the creator. Because once you begin to realize you are the one that has created everything in your life, you begin to go, wait a minute, so I'm the one doing this? Yeah. When you have that realization, when you can face yourself on that level, you will have an instant aha moment. Go, wait a minute. That means I can create whatever I want. Yes, that's the whole point of being responsible. The ability to respond. That's the whole reason to realize that you're the one who created this, which means you can create other things too. This is how you finally begin to realize how powerful you truly are. To Zippy, I'm going to say this. I believe there is a lesson here. There's something that you are supposed to learn from all of this. It's possibly there's something you're supposed to develop from all of this as well. Such as determination, persistence, pushing forward regardless. One thing I would like to ask for the first time I've ever done on this channel, I would like to ask all of you to dig deep and to pray for Zippy to heal, to heal his nervous system, his body, to take away any shame or fear that's blocking him up to where he can't walk. I want you guys to pray from your heart of hearts to God and to imagine healing energy going down into Zippy, healing his legs, healing his brain, healing his nervous system, and healing his entire emotional system. To take away the fear that's locking his energy and emotional system up. God bless you guys. Um, thank you for listening to this extent of the video. I didn't mean it to be this long, but it turned out that way. That's the end of this video. Uh, if you like this video, please click subscribe, click the like button. Go ahead and make a comment, pray for Zippy, and if, if you want, there's the donation button right down there in the description box. Click on it, it's a PayPal link, and make any kind of donation that you want, okay? God bless you guys, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.